So uh, we're here for um, a talk by Barbara Berenson um, called After Suffrage, the Campaign for the Equal Rights Amendment, 1920 to 2020, which basically um, takes off from the, from the passage, after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, this, is, this program is co-sponsored by the Westboro Center for History and Culture at the Westboro Public Library and also the Westboro Historical Society. So I'm gonna pass it over to Kathy Cavalier from uh, the Historical Society um, and go ahead, Kathy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tony and welcome Barbara and everyone attending. Uh, the Westboro Historical Society is pleased to co-sponsor this program. We've been preserving local history since our founding in 1889. Our headquarters, the historic Sibley House, is located at 13 Parkman Street, opposite the library. Uh, it houses three centuries of local history artifacts dating back to Westboro's founding in 1717. We educate school children on local history and sponsor history programs like this one, uh, both to educate the public and to keep history alive. Uh, we invite you all to like our Facebook page, which is Westboro Historical Society. And we invite you to check out our website, westborohistory.org. Um, as you can imagine, during the pandemic, uh, we've that's greatly hindered our ability to interact with the public. Uh, so we especially appreciate tonight's program. Uh, we look forward to hearing what followed the women's vote, both in history and politics. And we thank Barbara for sharing her knowledge and research with us. So thank you again for being here tonight. And I'd like to give a very special welcome to Barbara Berenson. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, once again, I just wanna confirm that you can see the screen share in the title. Perfect, okay. Um, so yes, um, this talk is a direct outgrowth of the work I did on the women's suffrage movement. Um, and the reason, of course, is that 1920, although very important, a very critical date when the 19th Amendment was adopted to become part of the Constitution, is not the end of the story of either women's rights or voting rights. 1920 is a milestone, but not a period. Both stories continue on. And this talk draws in part on work I did as co-editor of a book called Breaking Barriers, The Unfinished Story of Women Lawyers and Judges in Massachusetts, and it also previews the work I'm doing for what I hope will become my next book uh, in a couple of years. So what I am going to do to give you a sense of some of the important things that happened over the past century in women's rights is use the Equal Rights Amendment as an organizing principle. And the reason for that is that the ERA was something that was discussed and debated in the 1920s, again in the 1960s and 70s, and again today. So it allows us to take um, a little bit of a bird's eye view of some of what has been going on in the field of women's rights over the last century. And an important point to keep in mind as I begin is that the United States Constitution is the only major democracy that doesn't have a guarantee in its written constitution of equality of rights for men and for women. So before I begin, and most of my image, most of my slides, I promise you, are pictures, not words. I just want to remind you of what the Equal Rights Amendment would say if it were adopted to become part of the Constitution. And it says, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And for those of you who might follow what the US Supreme Court does, you know that the issue of the meaning of sex is actually now a little bit up in the air. When the ERA was written, sex of course referred to gender, male or female. But you may know that just this past June in the case of Bostock versus Clayton County, the Supreme Court held by a six to three majority that the word sex in the Title VII anti-discrimination law is not limited to strictly male or female, but also includes people who are homosexual or transgender. In other words, they gave it a broader classification. So one of the things just to keep in the back of your mind is if the ERA is adopted, how would it be interpreted and what would it mean? So let's go back to the beginning to 1920. 
Um, I hope that some of you have either read my book or other books about the suffrage movement or attended talks. Um, if so, you know that during the final years of the women's suffrage movement, there was a rivalry, a schism had occurred that pitted the majority National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was headed by Carrie Chapman Catt. The woman on the left of your screen is Maud Wood Park, who was the lead lobbyist in Washington, DC. And on the right side of your screen is Alice Paul. She was the head of the more militant National Women's Party. These were the ones that did things like picket in front of the White House. After 1920, Alice Paul continued the National Women's Party and the National American Women's Suffrage Association was renamed the League of Women Voters with Maud Wood Park as its president. But the rivalry didn't come to an end in 1920. They had, disagreed, they had agreed on suffrage, but disagreed over tactics. Now, however, they disagreed over substance as well. And what they disagreed over in the first instance in the 1920s was the Equal Rights Amendment. And the reason for that is that Maud Wood Park and the new League of Women Voters opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. And the reason for that is that in an era when the Supreme Court struck down over and over any kind of legislation that would have guaranteed workers maximum hours or minimum wages, the Supreme Court struck it down on the grounds that any laws like that interfered with liberty of contract. But very brilliantly, Louis Brandeis, a lawyer from Massachusetts who later becomes a justice on the US Supreme Court, argued in a very important 1908 case called Muller versus Oregon, that special law that had been passed in Oregon that limited woman only to a 10 hour day was constitutional. And the basis for that argument was his distinguishing woman from men on the grounds as he put it, or as the Supreme Court adopted from what he argued, that the physical well-being of the woman becomes an object of public interest because healthy mothers are essential to vigorous offspring. And that was something that was of the national interest. Laws like the laws that were upheld here, limiting women to 10 hours a day was called protective legislation. And women like Maud Wood Park, the League of Women Voters did not want to lose the benefits of protective legislation uh, in the search for a more abstract equality. Alice Paul disagreed. Dara Stevens was one of her colleagues in the National Women's Party. They argued the protective laws are a roadblock to equality. And they said, women ask the same rights, which with every man is now endowed through the accident of being born a male. In other words, they wanted total equality. Now, Alice Paul and Dara Stevens and the other woman in the small National Women's Party were by and large middle-class and well-educated and they were deemed able to, to want equality because they would have had good working conditions. But most women uh, sided with the League of Women Voters. Florence Kelly, who was an early and leading consumer advocate, Rose Schneiderman, who was a woman organizer, organizing women to labor unions. They said that the Equal Rights Amendment was far too sweeping. And I'm just gonna read you a short quotation from Rose Schneiderman to give you a sense of what the debate was like. Rose Schneiderman said, I dare say that if Alice Paul and Dara Stevens had to sort dirty linen instead of sitting in a nice airy office, and if she then had to go home and get her own dinner, wash them in clothes and had several children to take care of as well, she would be ready to be protected by legislation. The majority of women agreed with that sentiment. So the Equal Rights Amendment did not make headway during the 1920s, but it was the first time that it was debated. But other legislation that was pushed for and advocated for by the League of Women Voters did make headway. What were some of these pieces of legislation? They were legislation that would focus on aid from mothers and children and legislation that would prevent child, children from doing things like working in factories. So for example, the League of Women Voters and women's clubs and certain other women's organizations were behind an act that was passed by Congress in 1921, just one year after women had gained suffrage called the Shepherd Towner Act. And that act promoted the welfare of mothers and children 
um, the statistics, the death rate of children and of mothers giving birth were staggering in those years. And this legislation was supported by all these different organizations listed here, the League of Women Voters, the Women's Trade Union League, National Consumers League, General Federation of Women's Clubs and others. And what it did was provide for federal grants to go to the states for children's health programs and visiting nurses. Another important piece of legislation was a child labor amendment, which was proposed by Congress and sent out to the states to be ratified in 1924. Now, if you know the constitution and you know that there's no child labor amendment, you may be wondering right now, what happened? And the answer to what happened is that now we have to think about the opposition to this legislation. Just like there was always opposition to women's suffrage, there was opposition to these legislation, these legislative measures that were put forth by these women. And the opposition included a number of different entities. Um, it included organizations like the Woman Patriot Corporation, which was the continuation of the anti-suffrage associations, the woman who wanted to maintain the status quo as it had been. I um, mean, as you can see, if you can read the masthead, uh, the Woman Patriot newspaper says, dedicated to the defense of womanhood, motherhood, the family and the state against suffragism, feminism and socialism. So they were also arguing that these federal grants was somehow uh, baby socialism. Other opponents included the American Medical Association who did not want women interfering with medicine as they were practicing it. The Catholic Church, which was nervous about anything that they thought uh, might tend toward family planning, states rights advocates and others. So how did the legislation get this far? How did the Shepherd Towner Act pass and how did the child labor amendment get adopted in Congress? Um, they passed because the representatives in Congress and the Senate feared the new power of women voters. Women had been enfranchised in 1920. Now, not all women, I'm sure many of you know that no sooner were women enfranchised in 1920 than African-American women in the South were immediately stripped of the right to vote by the same Jim Crow laws that had stripped African-American men of their right to vote. Also, some women, of course, had been enfranchised before 1920, since some states had allowed women to vote before then. But 1920 was, of course, a major date in terms of bringing many more women voters um, into the electorate. So politicians feared what they saw as a potential new women's block. They passed the Shepherd Towner Act and they adopted the child or proposed to the states the child labor amendment. But within a few years, the Shepherd Towner Act was not renewed and the child labor amendment failed to be ratified. How did they fail? They failed because as election results were examined, politicians realized that there was back then no such thing as a woman's vote, that women tended to cast their vote on the same basis as men. They voted based on class or region or religion, whatever the local issues were, but they did not seem to vote based on gender. So the much uh, heralded woman's vote uh, turned out to be something that politicians decided they didn't have to worry about. And the ability of women to advance their legislative agenda largely came to a halt by the end of the 1920s. What I'm going to do now is jump to the 1960s, but before I get there, I'm just gonna remind you very, very quickly of a few milestones. So we have a little bit of a transition as we jump from the 1920s to the 1960s. So just a few key milestones on the way. Uh, very importantly, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938. That act, uh, implemented things like minimum wage and maximum hours for men as well as for women. And so that meant that there was no longer such a need for protective legislation. So this act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, was one of the important things that would pave the way for many women activists to embrace an equal rights amendment. Um, World War II, this is Rosie the Riveter, of course, um, wartime, whatever the negative consequences have been, uh, in terms of women's rights, women often advance during wartime because they take care of new jobs, the, jo the work that 
their husbands or fathers or sons aren't able to do while they're away fighting. Um, so World War II had brought many more women into the workforce, given many more women all sorts of new skills. The birth control pill. By 1960, many women could begin to finally control their own reproduction. And the civil rights movement. This is of course a picture of Rosa Parks uh, when she was arrested. The civil rights movement really gets underway in the 1950s, takes off in the 1960s. And that's very important for the women's rights because if you've been to other talks of mine or read about the suffrage movement, you know, for example, that the whole women's suffrage movement grew out of the abolitionist movement. When there are other civil rights movement that women tend to get involved with, that tends to wake women up to the lack of their own rights. So when black women and white women joined in the civil rights movement, that spurred on not only their participation in the civil rights movement, but also a new and separate women's movement. In 1960, when Kennedy was elected president, he appointed for the first time ever a commission on the status of woman to look at various discriminatory laws against women and to examine the status of women in the United States. And one thing that came, uh, another person working on that committee along with Eleanor Roosevelt, who was key, is a woman named Polly Murray, uh, a lawyer and also a minister. And Polly Murray coined a term that you might be familiar with called Jane Crow, in which she argued that just as Jim Crow laws uh, impose segregation and set forth efforts toward equality of African Americans, that Jane Crow law, laws operated in the same way against women. In 1963, one of the achievements of President Kennedy's Commission on the Status of Woman was the passage of the Equal Pay Act. This is the first legislation ever passed in this country uh, on behalf of equality for women. Now it's a limited law because what it prescribed was equal pay for equal work. And equal work didn't mean analogous work or similar work, it meant the exact same work. So it only protected women who were doing the exact same jobs as men. It didn't protect, for example, the differentials between nurses who are largely female and doctors who are largely male and so forth. But nonetheless, it was a very significant piece of legislation. Also in 1963, Betty Friedan published her famous book, The Feminine Mystique, in which she discussed the problem that has no name, as she called it. The problem, she was focused on middle-class educated women. And she talked about these middle-class educated women who had become slaves, as she put it, to their homes, their appliances, their husbands, and their children. And she argued that women wanted and women needed more. And this book became a runaway bestseller and influenced many people uh, to become involved in the women's movement. In 1964, soon after the death of President Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson as president was able to effectuate the passage of a landmark piece of legislation that we all call Title VII, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And that prohibits discrimination by covered employers, which basically means employers with more than 15 employees on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, and also on the basis of sex. So the first law to really prevent gender discrimination. And a new organization, government agency, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was established to handle complaints. But the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission had the commissioners on it, basically ignored sex discrimination complaints that were brought to their attention and focused only on race ones. And the frustration with the failure of the EEOC to respond to complaints under Title VII was one of the precipitating factors for a pivotal meeting that took place in 1966 when Polly Murray and Betty Friedan and other leading woman activists came together and formed a brand new organization called the National Organization for Women. And after forming the National Organization for Women, they wrote a statement of its purpose and they called directly for equal partnership of the sexes. 
and they said, we reject the current assumptions that a man must carry the sole burden of supporting himself, his wife, and his family, and that a woman is automatically entitled to lifelong support by a man upon marriage. And they also rejected that marriage, home, and family are primarily a woman's world and responsibility. Now also wrote a Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights led off with a claim for an equal rights constitutional amendment. So this is the moment when the ERA from the 1920s is fully revived. It had never fully died because Alice Paul, who lives all the way to 1977, every year would travel to Capitol Hill and seek to int interest members of Congress in putting forth the Equal Rights Amendment, but it never went anywhere. But now this brand new active organization now was behind an Equal Rights Amendment. And critically, one of the things that now said to women is that the issues that so many women are dealing with, sex discrimination, sexual harassment, the need for maternity leave, maternity benefits, childcare, and so forth, were not their own individual faults or individual problems, that they were broad societal issues and that they demanded a societal uh, response. After NAO's Bill of Rights, things take off very, very rapidly over the next few years. And many of you who are here tonight, I assume, uh, were either witnesses or perhaps even participants in some of these activities. So for instance, there were protests like this. Um, some of the young women, um, this is a protest uh, outside the Miss America pageant in 1968 in Atlantic City. So there were protests in the streets, a very important way of gaining attention. And of course, this was a method that had been used very successfully by the National Women's Party and Alice Paul during the suffrage movement. Uh, they also used legislative power, um, similarly to Maudwood Park lobbying Congress. But here, because women had the vote and could run for office, there were also advocates on the inside. So Shirley, Shirley Chisholm, for example, who was elected to Congress, the first African-American woman elected to Congress in 1968, introduces the Equal Rights Amendment in Congress in May of 1969. And she says that women do not need any protection that men do not need. What she said was, and this was the position of now, that we need laws to protect all working people, to guarantee them fair pay, safe working condition, conditions, and so forth. Shirley Chisholm also very famously said, one of my favorite quotations of all, um, is that if there's no room at the table for you to pull up a folded chair. Uh, August 26, 1970 was a very significant date. It was the 50th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, the Women's Suffrage Amendment. And on that day, now led by Betty Friedan, asked women to protest, to march, and to go on, as they put it, a strike for equality. So this is an example of one of the marches. There were many that took place in cities all over the country. This particular one is in New York. Uh, Gloria Steinem, begins, who also emerges as a leader of the women's rights movement, begins publishing a very influential magazine that is still being published today, Ms. Magazine. And some of you may have seen before this famous cover, uh, Wonder Woman for President. In other words, what used to be impossible, she was saying, is now perfectly possible. These ideas penetrated down even to popular culture. So in that same year, September 1970, the much beloved Mary Tyler Moore show pre uh, premiered on television. Now, if you watch reruns of Mary Tyler Moore, you will see how dated and old fashioned uh, and gender biased it is. But in that era, 50 years ago in September 1970, it was revolutionary because Mary Richards, the character played by Mary Tyler Moore, lived on her own in an apartment in the Twin Cities and worked at a job. She was not taken care of by either her father or a husband or boyfriend. In 1972, Martha Griffiths, a Congresswoman from Michigan, shepherded the ERA through Congress. 
And if you look at these margins, I mean, it's really staggering to realize that now had only been formed half a dozen years earlier. And that in 1972, by overwhelming majorities, the House and Senate approved of the Equal Rights Amendment to send to the states. In the House, the vote was 354 to 23. In the Senate, 84 to 8. I mean, you never see margins like this or virtually never nowadays. And it shows how uncontroversial a simple statement of basic equality in the Constitution for men and women had become. Um, however, opponents of the Equal Rights Amendment in Congress, and there were those ones who did oppose it, uh, insisted that there be a seven-year deadline for ratification in the enacting statute. And that becomes very significant. And it's also true that most amendments historically have not had deadlines. They just sort of are out there until they're either ratified by three quarters of the states or not. And I should back up and tell you that the rules for getting a constitutional amendment adopted are that you need two thirds of the approval of the House and of the Senate, and then you need ratification by the legislatures of three quarters of the states. So once the House and Senate had approved this, the Equal Rights Amendment, it now had to be ratified or agreed to accepted by three quarters or 38 states. In 1972, that first year, 22 states ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. It got off to a splendid and very rapid start. Um, this was also, unlike the suffrage movement, a movement that to use modern terms, we would call intersectional. The suffrage movement was about gender only. Suffragists generally did not want to talk about race, for example. But this movement for the Equal Rights Amendment, the more modern women's rights movement, embraced also issues that were near and dear to the hearts of minority women and also gay rights. So it was a very broad, inclusive movement. Um, so things looked pretty golden in 1972. But, and of course, you all lived through this, so this is not a surprise, um, you know that very soon serious opposition uh, would appear. And that opposition was led by Phyllis Schlafly, who created an organization called STOP ERA. STOP was actually an acronym. Very few people realize that. An acronym for the phrase, stop taking our privileges. Because what Phyllis Schlafly argued was that women who were homemakers, who were taken care of by husbands, who were not out in the workforce, were actually privileged. And what the bad people behind the ERA were going to do was take away those privileges. If we were together in person, I would ask all of you for a show of hands as to how many of you watched the excellent series within the past few months called Mrs. America about this history of the Equal Rights Amendment and Phyllis Schlafly. Um, I don't know how many of you did, but I assume that a number of you, and it really, I highly recommend it. It was excellent, if depressing. Um, so Phyllis Schlafly, uh, was very clever because what she argued was that the Equal Rights Amendment was not actually something that would help women, that it was an attack on women because it was an assault, as she said, on the role of woman as wife and mother and on the family as an organizing unit of society. And who were the women who agreed with Phyllis Schlafly? They were people generally who were wedded to the status quo, who didn't want change, and her strongest bases of support were full-time homemakers and regular churchgoers, whether they were Catholic or evangelical Protestants, um, but generally conservatives. Um, and this cartoon is actually from the suffrage era, but I think it applies just as well to Phyllis Schlafly and what she was doing. Because this cartoon shows back in the suffrage era, the danger of what would happen if a woman got the vote that she would leave behind home, children, and marriage and face only strife, disappointment, and loneliness. And this is what Phyllis Schlafly argued would happen if the Equal Rights Amendment came to pass. Advocates for the Equal Rights Amendment pushed back. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for example, and this is how she looked back in 1971, said that this pedestal, this pedestal of privilege that Phyllis Schlafly is talking about is really a cage 
that women might think they're on a pedestal where they're being taken care of, but really it is either an unpleasant cage or a gilded cage where what they can do and what they can learn and how they can spend their time are completely constrained by men. Equal rights ratification starts off fast. Um, that photo there shows Bella Abzug, another leader of the women's rights movement in the center with one of her trademark hats. Um, I mentioned earlier that 22 states ratified the Equal Rights Amendment in its very first year, 1972, and included, by the way, Massachusetts. In 1973, an additional eight states ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. So we are on our way to 30 of 38 in two years. 1973, something else critical happens. And that is the United States Supreme Court issues its ruling in the Roe versus Wade abortion case. Uh, in Roe versus Wade, as I'm sure every one of you is well aware, the US Supreme Court ruled that a woman has a right to abortion during at least the first trimester. Um, and that the state has no ability to stop a woman from having an abortion during that initial first trimester. There was what was called a joining of issues. Um, many of the women, the conservatives who were part of Phyllis Schlafly's Stop ERA were also strongly anti-abortion or as they would put it, pro-life. And the Stop ERA and the anti-abortion meeting uh, uh, anti-abortion uh, sentiment become joined and becomes essentially one movement. So after 1973, you would almost never hear somebody talk about opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment without also speaking out against abortion. And as you know, abortion remains a very contentious issue in our society almost 50 years later. Um, similarly, on the other side, there was a joining of issues. The now in its Bill of Rights, if you go back and look at that slide, you will see that a right to control one's own reproduction was part of the Bill of Rights. So the pro-ERA forces are also strongly pro-choice. So the debate over the Equal Rights Amendment gets wrapped up or enveloped by this better, very bitter cultural battle also over the right to abortion. And as a result of Phyllis Schlafly uh, and the abortion case and these different factors, the momentum for ERA, ERA ratification slows dramatically. 1974, only three additional states ratified. 1975 and 1977, only one each. If you add up those numbers, it brings you to 35, which means that three states are still needed for ratification. But the situation is potentially even more problematic because five states that had previously ratified the Equal Rights Amendment now pass new votes in their state legislatures seeking to undo or rescind those ratifications. And whether or not that is something that's permitted legally is still a matter that has never been decisively decided by the courts. So depending on how you count, you have ratification in 1977 of either 30 or 35 states. I'm just gonna pause for some water. 1977, this same year, Alice Paul dies um, as an older lady. Uh, and to commemorate her life and her work on behalf of the Equal Rights Amendment on August 26, which is the anniversary, as I've mentioned, of the day of ratification of the 19th Amendment, a memorial march is held for her. And this memorial march uh, is also serves as a rally in support of the Equal Rights Amendment. The legislation, uh, as I said, had a seven year deadline and the deadline was due to expire in 1979. In 1977, a national women's conference was held and the result of that conference and the momentum and the publicity from it is that Congress voted to extend the deadline for ratification by three years. So these activists now had, rather than being barred in 1979 until 1982 to try to seek ratification of the requisite 38 states. One of my favorite pictures is this one on the left which shows Rosalind Carter, Betty Ford, and Lady Bird Johnson all at this conference, all in support of the Equal Rights Amendment. 
that picture is also very poignant because it is also the last breath for bipartisan support of the Equal Rights Amendment. The reason the Equal Rights Amendment could have passed by such overwhelming majorities in the House and the Senate is that it was embraced by both the Democratic and the Republican Party. But that would change in 1980 when Gerald Ford would lose control of the Republican Party to Ronald Reagan. Before I get there, I should just mention that at the same time as this conference was taking place in Texas, a counter conference was also taking place led by Phyllis Schlafly. So I mentioned in 1980, Ronald Reagan becomes the standard bearer and then of course becomes the very successful president, uh, a Republican. And the Republican party in 1980 drops the, stand, the longstanding support for a couple of decades for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, and he does that in part at the urging of Phyllis Schlafly and also by Jerry Falwell, members of what we could now call the moral majority who claimed that there was moral decay that was crushing society and that women's rights was part of that moral decay, that feminism was an evil word that was turning our culture upside down. So 1980, uh, ends on a bad note um, because no more states ratify, even though the deadline was extended, as I said, by three years to 1982, there are no additional ratifications. So we end this period of time with 35 states having ratified the ERA. But as I mentioned, the legitimacy of the ratification of five of those 35 is arguably in question. Uh, meanwhile, however, and part of the reason some people barely even seem to notice the death of the Equal Rights Amendment in the early 1980s is that so much progress on behalf of women's rights were made by legislation and in the courts. Um, and the duo shown here, I'm sure you all recognize, of course, is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was first a very successful lawyer on behalf of women and then becomes appointed to the United States Supreme Court in 1993. And on the right, Sandra Day O'Connor, who the first woman to serve in the United States Supreme Court and a strong advocate for women. And what they did, Ruth Bader, led by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, is use the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which says that all citizens are entitled to, equ to equality, equality of rights, um, to argue that even though the 14th Amendment was passed by Congress, for purposes of adjust, addressing racial discrimination, it was one of the post-Civil War amendments, that nevertheless, based on the wording of it, it could apply as well to sex discrimination. And led by these advocates, the court adopted a standard of scrutiny saying that gender discrimination requires a close fit to an important government justification and many laws that were discriminatory against women were struck down as a result of this. This is another picture of Ruth Gated Ginsburg and Sandra Day O'Connor, obviously much later in life. Um, but they were a very powerful cohort um, leading the way to tremendous legal progress. Now we're gonna jump to the present. Um, but again, just like I did when I took us from 1920 to 1960, I'm just gonna pass through a very few milestones and photographs just to remind you of some of the many, I mean, the way too many to choose, highlights of some of these years. So of course, in 1984, we have the first woman uh, nominated uh, for a position on a major party candidate uh, ticket. This is Geraldine Ferraro, of course, who was nominated to be Walter Mondale's vice president in 1984. And of course, they lost to Ronald Reagan. In 1991, on the right, you have Anita Hill popularizing and bringing to popular consciousness the notion of sexual harassment when she testified against, against Clarence Thomas's nomination to the United States Supreme Court. 2007, Nancy Pelosi on the left, the first time she was elected Speaker of the House of Representatives. 2016, of course, Hillary Clinton, the first woman nominated uh, by a party to be its presidential candidate. Um, and here, of course, we have the Women's March from the weekend of Donald Trump's inauguration. We also, of course, have the Me Too movement over the last several years. And this is a cohort of new Congresswomen and senators 
wearing so-called suffrage white at the State of the Union address just a couple of years ago. Uh, but remember, uh, not all women have ever embraced women's rights, just like you had conservatives back in the 1920s and you had Phyllis Schlafly and her allies in the 1970s and 1980s. You also today, of course, have quite a large number of women who support, for example, President Trump, even though women's rights advocates would tell you that Trump is uniformly um, against women's rights. So women have, have proven clearly over time to never be a consolidated voting bloc. So why is there a new focus on the Equal Rights Amendment today? If you read the papers carefully, and you presumably by coming to this talk, you know that there is some new interest in the Equal Rights Amendment uh, in the 2000s. Uh, why is there new focus on the ERA today? A tremendous amount of it has to do with the United States Supreme Court. And here are the appointments of Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch, the United States Supreme Court. Because the United States Supreme Court now clearly has a five to four strong conservative majority. And many people are realizing that some of the rights they had taken for granted, this expectation that the court was going to continue to be a force uh, on behalf of women's rights is not at all necessarily the case. And then, of course, there's grave concern about the health and status of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, this picture here, some of you may recognize from Saturday Night Live a couple of years ago, uh, in which the only item on Ruth Bader Ginsburg calendar, according to Saturday Night Live, uh, was not to die. Um, but so this notion that whatever victories have been obtained by women under the 14th Amendment, under past court cases, are vulnerable because this new court may disagree. And as a result, there's been a new momentum to get the Equal Rights Amendment adopted and added to the Constitution over the last few years. Um, it's been given a name, the 38 state strategy, which makes perfect sense since of course 38 states, as you know, are needed to ratify. And Carolyn Maloney, a Congresswoman from New York, wrote to the archivist. The archivist is the person whose job it is essentially to add new, con new amendments to the constitution if they're ratified, that's one of his jobs. And Maloney wrote to the archivist in 2012 and basically said, gee, if we continue to ratify the ERA and get to 38, would you add it to the constitution? And he basically wrote back and said, you know, I don't know, but probably, or that might make sense, I can't remember his exact words, but certainly left the door open for that possibility, despite the fact that there had been this deadline of 1982, because the argument was that the deadline, the 1982 requirement of ratification, first 1979 and then 1982, were not in the amendment themselves. They were just in the enabling statute set forth by Congress. And so the argument was either that it could be changed by Congress, or maybe it wasn't even valid in the first place, since that's not part of the amendment process under the United States Constitution. So ERA advocates went on a campaign to seek to try to get ratification by three additional states. And amazingly, they have done so. Nevada ratified the ERA in 2017, Illinois in 2018, and Virginia, just this year, 2020, uh, in I believe January, it seems because of the pandemic, things in January or February now seem like 10 years ago, but it was just this year in 2020 that the 38th state ratified. Um, so what has happened and where are we today as we sit here on September 15, 2020? Well, one more piece of background I need to give you is that one of the arguments that Phyllis Schlafly and naysayers to the ERA have always made is that if the ERA were passed, that women could be drafted if men were drafted in wartime. And I'm sure you all know that currently under our selective service registration, men when they turn 18 have to register even though we only have a volunteer military. And in this past March, the National Commission on Military, National and Public Service issued its recommendation following a long period of study 
And the recommendation, which I suspect will soon be implemented, is that women at age 18 would also have to register. So that basically did away with perhaps the strongest argument of naysayers to the ERA. So where are we today? Where we are is that after the 38th state ratified, after Virginia, ERA advocates wrote to the archivist and said, here's the 38th state, please add the ERA to the constitution. Before he had a chance to reply, President Trump's lawyer told the archivist, no, you cannot do that because the ERA had expired because of the 1982 deadline. In response to that, two different things have happened. There has been action in Congress. The House passed a resolution to remove the deadline because obviously they say that if Congress could impose a deadline in a piece of legislation, now we can remove it. It was removed this past February, but under the Republican controlled Senate, there has not been any action. Um, so that's where that stands. And then the other front of activity has been in the courts. And two lawsuits have been brought, one here in Massachusetts and one in the District of Columbia, arguing that a court should tell the archivist to add the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. The case brought here in Massachusetts was actually dismissed a few weeks ago or maybe a month ago on the grounds that the advocates in that case, which were some women's rights organizations, did not have what's called legal standing, grounds to be a party in a case over the legitimacy of a constitutional amendment. In the District of Columbia case, however, the plaintiffs are the states that have now ratified, Virginia, Illinois, Nevada. Um, and the Trump administration has filed a motion to dismiss, arguing that this is not an issue that belongs before the courts, that only Congress can decide the process and legitimacy of constitutional amendments. Um, the case has not yet been decided, but whatever the outcome is, you can be sure that it will be appealed and may well end up before the United States Supreme Court, where, as I mentioned, it's hard to predict outcomes. This certainly is a strong five to four conservative majority, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can predict the outcome of any particular case. Um, and then, of course, we have a very consequential election just around the corner in which both the presidency and the Senate control are up for grabs, potentially. Um, and that, of course, could affect what happens. So that is a very quick overview um, of the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, both past and present, using, as I said at the outset, it really as an organizing principle um, to shed some light on some of the many, many activities over the last century. What I'm going to do now is stop sharing my screen so I can see all of you. Um, and I would love to open it up for questions and also comments. And I will tell you, I love comments as well because at virtually every one of these talks I've given, I have encountered at least one person and sometimes more who themselves have been involved in efforts on behalf of or against the Equal Rights Amendment or their mothers or family members and so forth. So I'm every bit as interested in comments as questions. And I don't know whether people will, how you want to feel, how you want questions to be asked if you're using a chat room or if people should just raise their hands or speak out, but I will leave it to you to uh, let me know. And uh, I would love to hear from as many of you as we have time for. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll just I'll just start briefly by just saying um, it's my understanding that Ivanka Trump has been working on women related issues as part of the White House uh, effort. Do, are you, do you have any information about you know has what she's proposing? I think child care legislation or you know other work related things. Are are you familiar with any of that or? Well, I have to say my my you know. The tr Trump administration and women's rights um, seem to me inconsistent principles is about all I would have to say on that matter. Um, so it's not certainly not something that I have given a lot of attention to. Um, and certainly the Trump led Republican party has no interest in the equal rights amendment. Um, whether there are some you know, pieces of legislation that some individual um, may you know, support in an effort to try to convince women that the Republican party stands for them you know, that I'm sure that's something that's happening.
Um, you had talked about the um, the five states that tried to rescind um, that. Is there any precedent? Has has any other states in of any other kind of amendment process tried to rescind their, um, you know, their? That that's a great question. So the answer is that the courts very much want to stay away from this issue. Um, it's really one of the relatively few clear cut issues under the constitution that's never been decisively considered. Mm -hmm. The only time it's really come up was after the civil war, when some states ratified the 14th amendment, uh, seeking to become readmitted to the union and then immediately sought to undo that ratification and it was not allowed. Um, after the 19th amendment, there were a couple of states, including Tennessee, which was the last state to ratify the 19th amendment that also tried to undo ratification and it was not allowed then either. So to the extent there is precedent, it suggests that you cannot rescind, but it's really not something in modern times that's been addressed by the court. My bet though, personally, and, and as a lawyer um, is that if the court had to address that issue, I think they would stay away from deciding rescission, pure and simple. And what they would probably do instead is raise a doctrine called the contemporaneousness doctrine, which is the argument that ratifications have to occur within some ballpark contemporary uh, period of proposal. Um, so that the states that ratify in year one are ratifying something similar, at least they think, to what states that might ratify in year 10 are ratifying. But if year 10 is instead year 50, you could argue that times have changed so much that that might not be the case. So that would probably be how the court might approach it. Um, what they would do, I don't know. My bet is, again, you know, it's like reading tea leaves, but may well be that they would decide that they shouldn't get involved at all, that the issue, this belongs to Congress, rather than necessarily take on head on the issue of rescission. But we'll see. Hmm. I'm sure many of you must have questions or comments. And remember, there's no such thing as a bad question. Yes. Unmute, unmute, unmute yourself, Chris. You need to That's right. If you go down to the bottom, there's uh, there should be a, a ribbon that goes across, and there's a it says mute, um, and you can unmute yourself or Alt and A. <clears throat> There you go. Chris. I always uh, tend to keep myself muted to everybody's delight. <laughs> um, I am one of the women that came of age during the 60s. And my mother, uh, who was uh, college educated, said the only careers open to women at her time were a teacher, and you couldn't be married if you were a teacher. At least that's what she said. Once you got married, you couldn't teach. And that people were secretaries or nurses. But basically, you didn't have other careers to aspire to. So uh, when I was in school in the 60s, it was very exciting to sort of have the world open up that women could do different careers that men had pursued and be as educated as they. And uh, we joined lots of marches as far as um, the ERA and follow Gloria Steinem. And it was inspiring. And uh, we were really angry at the women who were opposed to women's rights. We couldn't understand it. So um, perhaps some of that has uh, continued, but having uh, young women, um, now my daughter and granddaughter involved in school, it does seem that they haven't got many restrictions as far as careers go and aspirations to uh, fulfill their careers. So I have a question for you, if you don't mind. <laughs> when the ERA failed in the early 1980s, do you remember how you felt? Did you feel it was devastating or did you feel like it was a disappointment, but at least with the court, we're okay? How did you, how did you react? 
um, devastated because we had felt that this was um, sort of a a no brainer that women deserve the equal rights and it made perfect sense. And we had been working for that for years and could not understand women who rejected it or courts and men who rejected it. So we were, we were angry. That's why we were marching all the time. Yes. Thank you very much. Other questions, comments? And it certainly can be broader than what, what I had a chance to cover in, you know, 45 or 50 minutes. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to, to say or ask about? Um, I would just like to thank you. That was extremely interesting. And uh, I, in the 60s, I very much uh, subscribed to Ms. Magazine and and listened to, uh, to Gloria Steinem and, and all the rest. And I actually, back then, you could become um, like a member. And I remember carrying this little card in my wallet, you know, as a member. <laughs> Of the National Organization for Women. And um, I, I agree that there has been a lot of progress as far as careers. But I remember one particular um, article I saw, and it this was in the, uh, I guess, the early 70s. And it was a woman uh, carrying uh, a briefcase, dressed in a suit, carrying a briefcase, and, um, you know, there was a, a child next to her and a dog, you know, and it said, the caption read somewhat like, women can have it all. So we could have a career and we can have a family life if we, if we like. We had options, we were given options. And um, when I saw how many women were actually against being, um, to have this liberation and think that, oh, everything's going to be taken away. You know, uh, no one will open a car door for you. Uh, we won't have those niceties. And I couldn't understand all of that because we could open our own doors and things like that. So, but um, it was a very, actually back then, you know, with the beginning of it all, it was a very exciting time. And so when I read about the suffragettes in 1920, I think, wow, what was that time like? You know, what, what was that? Because it was so exciting in the 60s and the 70s. And it, it's just, um, I'm just happy that women have been able to come along as much as they, they have. And I only hope that we can go even farther and really truly have equality. Well, thank you for that lovely comment. And I will tell you when you talk about how exciting it was, in the 1960s and the 1970s, the suffragists had a lot of that too. I mean, in the early years, because remember the suffrage movement is almost a hundred years. In the early years, it was such a struggle and they were met with such derision and it took such incredible persistence and will to be a part of the suffrage movement. But later on, by the time you get to the 20th century in the last 10 to 20 years, when it becomes, even though it still has a way to go, much more of a mass movement, one of the things that comes through so often in the writings of the suffragists um, looking back on or even contemporaneous letters that they wrote to their family and friends is that they were also really having fun, that it was a grand and wonderful adventure with friends um, striving to improve the world, to change the world for the better. So there really are, I think, a lot of similarities in terms of how people who were involved felt about their involvement. Um, of course, the suffrage movement ends with a great success, even if it's not a complete success. Um, the women's movement in the 60s and 70s ends with many successes, but without the overwhelming, um, overarching success of the Equal Rights Amendment. Hopefully that will come soon. <laughs> we will see. <laughs> We've all been disappointed before, so. <laughs> um, anybody else have questions or comments, uh, including Anthony or Kathy or anybody? I think we have just a couple more minutes, but it's up to all of you. So Barbara, I was, I was curious, because I, um, 
I was very young when when the Equal Rights Amendment was coming through, and I, but I remember my mother being a very strong supporter. She wasn't a marcher or anything, but you know, I, but I remember her be, being very interested in it. And um, but I'm originally from Illinois, and so I was I was curious as to what happened. And then I saw from your presentation here that Illinois ended up being one of the very recent ones. So clearly it didn't pass back then, which is kind of surprising, especially given now when you see sort of the political alignment, right? You, you identify Illinois as, as a strong democratic state um, or progressive state. Do you know anything offhand about Illinois and what it's, you know, like, why did it not pass back then? On my other monitor, I am just gonna double check that <laughs> Phyllis Schlafly lived in Illinois. Oh, uh, yes, Phyllis Schlafly, because she was from Missouri, um, and then they moved to Alton, Illinois. So, oh, okay. and if you watch the Mrs. America series, Illinois becomes one of these showdown places. Oh, I'm gonna have to watch that. It's been on my list, and I think. It I mean, you know, I'm not really my radar it. screen, and so maybe I'll bring it back, and we'll. Uh... I'm not much of a, a TV watcher. It's nine parts, but honestly, you know, and, and, and it's, I wish it had been all historic. I mean, it's definitely some historic fiction mixed in, but mm -hmm. it really does overall. Did any of you, now I can see all of you before I couldn't <laughs> when I was speaking, but did anybody here who's on the screen watch it? No. I mean, it really does do an excellent job of giving you you know, reminding you of what happened and in particular of really giving you some insights into Phyllis Schlafly. And one of the things that the series does very well um, that's reflected in all the books and so forth, you know, that I've read and, and I'm working on for my next book is that one of the things that made people like Gloria Steinem and others apoplectic was that Phyllis Schlafly, of course, violated what she preached. I mean, mm -hmm. at the same time as she was telling women, stay home, take care of your children, that's all you should do, that should satisfy you 100%, she was traveling all over the country, leading rallies, being on television. I mean, she epitomized the working career woman. Um, and so, and, and I think they do a really excellent job of bringing that out. And the fact of how many women were yet duped by her you know, as they sat and listened to this woman who's out on the stump day in and day out, telling them that all they should do is stay home and make apple pie and that will make them happy. So anyway. Barbara, what is your next book? Uh, your my, next topic? Uh, my next book, what I am actually doing is I am carrying the suffrage story uh, from some of the Massachusetts leaders forward into the 1920s and looking at some of the major debates of the 1920s, immigration, the Sacco and Vanzetti case, the child labor amendment, the ERA and so forth, through the eyes of some of these individual activists. Because one of the things that people often think, or, or very often people have no idea what these people did after 1920. I mean, some of them were thrilled that the 19th amendment had been adopted and just went home or went to work. But many of them, of course, continued lives in activism because they really wanted the vote, not just for the vote, but to make certain kinds of changes. Hmm, interesting. Okay, well, it's been, uh, we're, we're over eight, uh, five minutes after eight here. So unless someone else has some something burning, I guess we'll end the uh, program here. Well, thank you very much for having me. And um, it was really lovely to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. This was really interesting. Thank you. It's fascinating. fascinating. Yeah, it'll be great. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.